Show. I'm Rin. And I'm Shay. And today, Shay will be continuing the Wind Up Girl. If you haven't checked out the first part where she covered the first three chapters, it is up on YouTube. I highly suggest going to watch that and then coming back to this one. It will take you uh, three hours, so just check this VOD when it comes up on YouTube as well. Or watch them all together so you don't have to wait. Now, for anyone who's familiar, not familiar with this setting, this is a near future dystopian uh, uh, kind of world. There's several books in the series. None are the same story, but um, we we learned a few things in the, last, in the first three chapters of this book, mostly about where this is taking place, which is in Bangkok. Uh, we know uh, from other books we've read and from uh, from information from this one that the ocean levels have risen, so many cities are drowned. This one is not. Uh, as we have, as they mentioned, they're using pumps to keep this city from from sinking into the sea, as it were. Uh, but it also introduced uh, three major characters who we will see throughout uh, throughout the story. Uh, we met we met Anderson Lake, who is a a calorie company. Uh, executive -y type of guy with a hobby of looking for valuable genes because calories are our currency in this world. Uh, there's, we also met um, Pak Sang, who is the, uh, um, who is this uh, Chinese kind of only kind of Chinese? Kind of Chinese. Well, China doesn't exist anymore <laughs> in this setting. This is why I say that. Um, lots of places don't exist anymore. Uh, near future dystopian setting. Actually, I think China is the most recently not existing anymore uh, because it, it, cause it mentioned it happened like in his lifetime. And I like that these books never really explain, you know, the series of events that led up to this being such a dystopian world. Um, it's just, it's just, you know, the world's messed up. Um, a lot of it's environmental stuff. Um, there's allusions to, you know, a few different wars. Um, there's, uh, and, and they never really say like what happens to these, but um, Hawk saying, uh, like in his lifetime, was apparently a um, you know very wealthy individual. Before um, I think they mention they mention the 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 green headbands with their machetes, um, who who upturned them because they weren't being treated right or something along those lines. But they never get into any like any details or anything. You just let your own mind kind of pieced together the things. Um, and we also met Emiko, who is part human? The wind-up girl. The wind-up girl. She is the wind-up girl. Um, she is she is an artificial human, uh, is what she is. Um, she has uh, modified genes. Um, which give her certain qualities, like very small pores so for super smooth skin, uh, which is not working out well for her in, in Bangkok, where it's very, very hot and humid. Um, uh, but she was kind of an assistant before and ended up being abandoned in the city and now is forced to essentially work as a uh, sex slave, for lack of a better term, um, unless she wants to end up getting caught in mulch by religious fanatics. Um, so those are, those are the three characters who were introduced. More will be, um, and I like, and I will, I will say that 
there are some some dark scenes in this book uh, we ran into a couple in the last few chapters um, if anything makes you uncomfortable feel free to step away uh, but uh, yeah without further ado I'll get back into the story uh, we did also hear let's see I wonder if there's anything a couple important things they found the gnoll gnoll which is a fruit that was extinct Anderson found it um, they mentioned some things with the uh, with the with the vats for cultivating algae for some company and they also and uh, Emiko also heard from uh, from Anderson about some supposed city where just the new people uh, live but without further ado I'll get right into it 500 1000 5000 750 Protecting the kingdom from all the infections in the natural world is like trying to catch the ocean with a net. One can snare a certain number of fish, sure, but the ocean is always there, searching through. 10,000? 12,500? 15,000? 25,000? Captain, and forgive me, I, I will try to pronounce this to the best of my ability. Captain J.D. Rojana Sukchai. Rojana is more than aware of this as he stands under the vast belly of a Farang dirigible in the middle of the sweltering night. Their dirigible's turbo fans gust and whir overhead. Its payload lies scattered, crates and boxes splintered open, their contents spilled across the anchor pad as though a child has recklessly strewn his toys. Sundry valuables and inter interdicted items lie everywhere. 30,000, 35,000, 50,000. Around him, Bangkok's newly renovated airfield spreads in all directions, lit by high intensity methane lamps mounted on mirror towers, a vast green, Bathed, a vast green bathed expanse of anchor pads dotted with the massive balloons of the Farang, of the Farang floating high overhead, and at its edges the thickly grown walls of high grow bamboo and spun barbed wire that are supposed to define the international boundaries of the field. Sixty thousand, seventy thousand, eighty thousand. The Thai Kingdom is being allowed, being swallowed. JD idly surveys the wreckage his, his men have wrought, and it seems obvious they are being swallowed by the ocean. Nearly every crate holds something of suspicion, but really the crates are symbolic. The problem is ubiquitous. Gray market chemical baths, crates, oops, gray market chemical baths are sold in Chattachuk market and men pull their skiffs up the Chow Freya in the dead of night and with holes full of next-gen pineapples. Pollen wafts down the peninsula in steady surges, bearing agrogen and pure cow's latest genetic new rights, rewrites, while Ches Cheshire's molt through the garbage of the Suez and Jing Jok too and Jean Jock two lizards vandalize the eggs of night jars and peafowl. Ivory beetles floor through the forests of cow yai even as Sivisosis sugars blister us and fagan fringe bore through the vegetables and huddled humanity of the Krung threat. Which most of those names, uh, those last three, I, are references to various diseases. It is the ocean they all swim in, the very medium of life. Nineteen, one hundred thousand, one hundred ten, one hundred twenty-five. Great minds like Primwadi Sris Sris Srisati and. 
Afichat Krumikorn may argue over best practices for protection or debate the merits of UV sterilization barriers among the kingdom's borders versus the wisdom of preemptive gene hack mutation. But in JD's views, they're, they are idealists. The ocean always flows through. 126, 127, 128, 129,000. JD leans over. Lieutenant Kanya, Kanya Shira Fibat's shoulder and watches as she counts bribe money. A pair of customs inspectors and stand stiffly aside, waiting for their authority to be returned to them. 130, 140, 150. Kanya's voice is a steady chant. Uh, a, a PM to wealth to greasing the skids to new business in the ancient country. Her voice is clear and meticulous. With her, the count will always be correct. J.D. smiles. Nothing wrong with a little gift of goodwill. At the next anchor pad, 200 meters away, Megadons scream as they drag cargo out of the dirigible's belly and pile the shipment and pile the, the shipment for sorting and customs approval. Turbofans gust and surge, stabilizing the fast airship anchored overhead. The balloon lists and spins. Gritty winds and megadont dung, megadont dung scour across JD's array. White shirts. Kanya places a hand over the bot as she is counting. The rest of JD's men will wait, impassive, their hands on machetes as the as the winds whip against them. The turbofan gusts, gusts subside. Kanya continues her chant. 160, 170, 180. The custom men, customs men are sweating. Even in the hot season, there's no reason to sweat so. JD isn't sweating. But then, he's not the one who's been forced to pay twice for protection that was probably expensive the first time. J.D. almost pities them. The poor men don't know what lines of authority may have changed. If payments have been rerouted, if J.D. represents a new power, or a rival one. Don't know where he ranks in the layers of bureaucracy and influence that runs through the Environment Ministry. And so they pay. He's surprised that they managed to find the cash at all on such short notice, almost as surprised as they must have been when his white shirt smashed the doors of the customs office and secured the field. 200,000. Kanya looks up at him. It's all here. JD grins. I told you they'd pay. Kanya doesn't return the smile, but JD doesn't let it damp his glee. It's a good hot night, and they've made a lot of money. And as a bonus, they've watched the custom service sweat. Kanya always has difficulty accepting good fortune when it comes her way. Somewhere during her young life, she lost track of how to take pleasure. Starvation in the Northeast, the loss of her parents and siblings, hard travels to, to crumb threat, crumb threat. Somewhere, she lost her capacity for joy. She has no appreciation for Sanuk, for fun, even such intense fun, such intense fun, such Sanuk Mak as successfully shaking down the trade ministry for the celebration of, of Songkran. And so when Kanya takes 200,000 baht from the, from, from the trade ministry and doesn't bat an eye except to wipe away the scouring dust of the anchor pads, and certainly doesn't smile, and certainly doesn't smile, J.D. doesn't let it hurt his feelings. Kanya has no taste for fun. That is her comma. Still, J.D. pities her. Even the poorest people smile sometimes. Kanya almost never. It's quite unnatural. She doesn't smile when she is embarrassed, when she is irritated, when she is angry, or when she has joy. It makes others uncomfortable. Her complete lack of social grace, and it is why she landed last in JD's unit. 
No one else can stand her. The two of them make sh make a strange pair. J.D., who is always finding something to, to smile at, and Kanya, whose face is so cold it might as well be carved from jade. J.D. grins again, sending goodwill to his lieutenant. Let's back it up again. You've overstepped your authority, one of the custom men, customs men mutters. J.D. shrugs complacently. The Environment Ministry's jerks, jurisdiction is extends to every place where the Thai Kingdom is threatened. It is the will of Her Majesty the Queen. The man's eyes are cold, even though he forces himself to smile pleasantly. You know what I mean. J.D. grins, shrugging off the other's ill will. Don't look so forlorn. I could have taken twice this much, and you still would have. Tanya begins packaging up the money as J.D. sifts through the wreckage of the crate with the tip of his mach machete. Look at all this important cargo. That must be protected. He flips over a bundle of kimonos, probably shipped to a Japanese manager's wife. He stirs through lingerie worth more than his month's salary. We wouldn't want some grubby official rifling through all of this, would we? He grins and glances at Kanya. Do you want any of this? It's made of real silk. The Japanese still have silkworms, you know. Kanya doesn't look up from her work with the money. It's not my size. Those Japanese manager wives are all fat on gene hack calories and their deals with Agvision. You would steal too? The customs official's face is a mask of controlled rage behind a polite gritted smile. Apparently not, J.D. shrugs. My lieutenant seems to have better taste than the Japanese. Anyway, your profits will return, I'm sure. This will be but a minor inconvenience. And what about the damage? How will that be explained? The other custom man waves at a folding screen in this, in this Sony style that lies half-torn. J.D. studies the artifact. It's shows what he supposes must be the equivalent of a samurai family for the late 22nd century. A Mishimoto fluid dynamics manager overseeing some kind of wind-up workers in the field and... Are those ten hands on each worker that he sees? J.D. shudders at the bizarre blasphemy. The small, natural, family pictured at the edge of the field doesn't seem perturbed, but then they are Japanese. They even let their children be entertained by a wind by a wind up monkey. JD makes a face. I'm sure you'll find some excuse. Perhaps the freight megaton stampeded. He claps the customs men on their backs. Don't look so glum. Use your imagination. You should think of this as building merit. Kanya finishes packing up the money. She secures the woven satchel and slings it over her shoulder. We are done, she says. Downfield, a new dirigible is slowly descending its massive kink spring fans, using up the last of their jewels to maneuver the beast over its anchors. Cable snake down from its belly, dragged by lead weights. Anchor pad workers wait with upraised hands to secure the floating monster to their megadon teams. As though praying to some massive god, J.D. watches with interest. In any case, the Benevolent Association of Retired and Royal Environment Ministry Offers appreciates this. You've built merit with them regardless. He hests his machete and turns to his men. Kun, officers! He shouts over the drone of the dirig dirigible fans and the scream of freight megadons. I have a challenge for you. He points to the descending dirigible with his machete. I have 200,000 baht for the first man who searches a crate from that new vessel over there. Come on, that one, now. The custom men, customs men stare, dumbstruck. They start to speak but their voices are drowned out by the roar of dirigible fans. 
they mouth protestations. My turn. My tum. My. My. T uh, my. Tong tum. No. 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 As they wave their arms, Machek JD is already dashing across the airfield, brandishing his machete and howling after his, this new prey. Behind him, his white shirts follow in, in a wave. They dodge crates and laborers, leap over anchor cables, duck under megadont bellies. His men, his loyal children, his sons, the foolish followers of ideals, and the queen joining his call, the ones who cannot be bribed, the ones who hold all the honor of the environment ministry in their hearts. That one, that one. They speed like pale tigers across the landing field, leaving the car carcasses of Japanese freight containers littered behind them like so much debris after, debris after a typhoon. The customs men's voices fade. JD is already far distant from them, feeling the joy of his legs pumping under him, the pleasure of clean and honorable pursuit, running faster, ever faster, his men following covering the distance with the adrenaline spent of pure warrior purpose, raising their machetes and axes to the giant machine as it comes down from the sky, looming over them like the demon king T Tosakan, 10,000 feet tall, settling over them, the Megadont of all Megadons, and on its side, infrared lettering, infrared lettering, the words Carlisle and Sons. J.D. is unaware that a shriek of joy has escaped his lips. Carlisle and Sons. The irritating Ferang, who speaks so casually about changing pollution credit systems, of removing quarantine inspections, of streamlining everything that has kept the kingdom alive as other countries have collapsed. The foreigner... The foreigner who curries so much favor with the trade minister, Akarat, and the Sondet, Chalpreya, the crown protector. This is a true prize. JD is all pursuit. He stretches for the landing cables as his men surge past. Younger and faster and fanatically dedicated, all of them reaching out to secure their quarry. But this dirigible is smarter than the last. At the sight of the white shirt swarming under the landing position, the pilot reorients his turbofans. The wash gushes over JD. The fans scream and rev as the pilot wastes gigajoules in an attempt to push away from the ground. The dirigible's landing cables whip inward, winding on spindle crates like, a, like an octopus yanking in its limbs. The turbofans shove JD to the ground as they spin to full power. The dirigible rises. JD pushes himself up, squinting into the hot winds as the dirigible shrinks into the night blackness. He wonders if the disappearing monster was warned by the control towers of the customs service, or if the pilot was simply clever enough to realize that a white shirt inspection was of no benefit to his masters. JD grimaces, Carlisle, Richard Carlisle, too clever by half, that one. Always in meetings with Akarat, always at public benefits for Sibisosis victims, tossing money about, always talking about the positives of free trade. He is just one of dozens of Harang who have returned to the shores like a jellyfish after, after, bitter, after a bitter water epidemic, but Carlisle is the loudest. The one whose smiling face annoys J.D. the most. JD pushes himself fully upright and brushes off the hemp weave of his uniform. It doesn't matter. The dirigible will return. Like the ocean rushing onto the beach, it is impossible to ke keep the farang away. Land and sea must intersect. These men, with prophets in their beating hearts, have no choice. They must rush in, no matter the consequences. And he must meet them. Kama. JD slowly returns to the cracked contents of the, ins of the inspected shipping crates, wiping his face as wet, breathing from the exertion of his run. 
He waves at his men to continue their labor. There, break those open over there. I don't want a single crate uninspected. The customs men are waiting for him. He pokes through a few new crates wreckage with the point of his machete as two men approach. They're like dogs, impossible to be rid of unless you feed them. One of them tries to prevent JD from swinging his machete into another crate. We paid. We are. F we will be filing protests. It will be investigations. This is international soil. JD makes a face. Why are you still here? We paid a fair price for protection. More than fair. JD shoulders past them. But I'm not here to debate those things. It is your dharma to protest. It is mine to protect our borders. And if that means I must invade your international soil to save our country, so be it. He swings his machete and another crate cracks open. Whether all would bust wide. You've overstepped yourself. Probably. But you will have to send someone from the, from the ministry, ministry of trade to tell me himself. Someone more much powerful than you he spins his machete thoughtfully unless you wish to debate me now with my men the two flinch JD thinks he catches a flicker of a smile on Kanyo's lips he glances over surprised but his lieutenant is again the face of blank professionalism it is pleasant to see her smile JD briefly wonders if there is something more he can do to encourage a second flash of teeth from his dour subordinate. Sadly, the custom men, customs men seem to be reconsidering their position. They're backing away from his machete. Do not think you can insult us in this way without consequence. Of course not. J.D. chops at the shipping crate again, shattering it fully. But I appreciate your monetary donation, even so. He looks up at them. When you complain, make sure to tell them that it was me, J.D. Rojana Sukachai, who did this work. He grins again. And make sure you tell them that you actually tried to bribe the tiger of Bangkok. Around him, his men all laugh at the joke. The customs men step back surprised at this new revelation, the dawning comprehension of their opponent. J.D. surveys the destruction around him. Splinters of balsa, balsa crate material lie everywhere. The crates are engineered for strength and weightlessness, and their lattice works well enough to hold goods as long as no one applies a machete. The work goes quickly. Materials are pulled from the crate and laid in careful rows. Customs men hover, taking the names of his white shirts until his men finally raise their machetes and give chase. The officers retreat, then stop and observe from a safer distance. The scene reminds J.D. of animals fighting over a carcass. His men feeding on the offal of foreign lands while the scavengers probe and test. The ravens and Cheshires and dogs all waiting their own chance to converge on the carrion. The thought depresses him a little. The customs men's men hang back, watching. JD inspects the line of sorted contents. Kanya follows close, close behind. JD asks, What do we have, Lieutenant? Agar solutions, nutrient cultures, some kind of breeding tanks, pure cow cinnamon, a papaya seed stock we don't recognize. A new iteration of Utex that probably sterilizes any rice varietal it meets. She shrugs. About what we expected. JD flips open a shipping container's lid and peers inside. Checks the address. A company in the Farang Manufacturing District. He tries sounding out the foreign letters and then gives up. He tries to remember if he's seen the logo before, but doesn't think so. He fingers through the materials inside. Sacks of some sort of protein powder. Nothing of wonderful interest then. 
No new version of Blister Us leaping out of the box from Agrigen and Pure Cow. No. It's a pity we couldn't catch that last original. They ran quite quickly. I would have liked to search the cargo of Coon Carlisle. Conya shrugs. They will return. They always do. Like dogs to a carcass, she says. JD follows Kanya's gaze to the customs men, watching from their safe distance. He is saddened that they see the world so similarly. Does he influence Kanya, or does she influence him? He used to have much more fun at this work, but then work used to be much more clear-cut. He's not accustomed to stalking the gray landscapes that Kanya walks, but at least he has more fun. His reverie is broken by the arrival of one of his men, Somchai, sauntering over, his machete swinging casually. He's a fast one, as old as J JD, but hard-edged hard and hard-edged from losses when Blister Us swept the north for the third time in a single growing season. A good man, and loyal, and clever. There's a man watching us, Somchai mumbles as he draws close to the two of them. Where? Somchai jerks his head subtly. JD lets his eyes roam the bustle of the landing fields. Beside him, Kanya stiffens. Somchai nods. You see him then? Ka! She nods, affirmative. JD finally catches sight of the man standing a good distance away, watching both the white shirts and the customs men. He has on a simple orange sarong and purple linen shirt, as if he might be a laborer, and, and yet he carries nothing. He does nothing, and he seems well fed, not showing ribs and hollow cheeks the way most laborers do. He watches, casually leaning against the anchor hook. Trade, JD asks. Army, Kanya guesses. He's a confident one. As though he senses JD's eyes, the man turns. His eyes lock with JD for a moment. Shit, Somchai frowns. He's seen us. He and Kanya join JD in an open study of the man. The man is unperturbed. He spits a stream of red petal and turns and saunters away disappearing into the bustle of freight movements. Som Chai asks, should I go after him? Question him? JD cranes his neck, trying to catch another glimpse of the man where he has been swallowed by the bustle. What do you think, Kanya? She hesitates. Haven't we prodded enough clover for one night? JD smiles slightly. The voice of wisdom and restraint speaks. Som Chai nods agreement. Trade will be furious at as it is. One hopes so. JD motions to Som Chai to return to his inspections as they watch him go. Kinda says, we may have overstepped this time. You mean I may have overstepped this time, have overstepped. JD grins. You're losing your nerve? Not my nerve. Her gaze travels back to where their observer disappeared. They are bigger fish than us, Coon, J.D. The anchor pads. Kanya trails off. Finally, after visibly working to choose her word, she says, It's an aggressive mood. You're sure you're not afraid? He teases her. No. She stops short, swallows her out or outburst, masters her composure. Privately, J.D. admires her ability to speak with a cool heart. He was never so careful with his words or his actions. He was always the sort to change in like a Megadon and try to right the trampled rice shoots after Jairon rather than Jayen. A hot heart rather than a cool one. Kanya, though. Finally, she says, this may not have been the best place to strike. Don't be a pessimist. The anchor pads are the best of all places. Those two weevils over there coughed up 200,000 baht. No trouble at all. 
Too much money to be involved in anything honest. J.D. grins. I should have come here a long time ago and taught those he a lesson. Better than wandering a river with Kink Springs gif arresting children for gene rip smuggling. At least this is honest work. But it will get trade involved for certain. By law, it's their turf. By any sane law, none of this should be imported at all. JD waves a hand, dismissive. Laws are confusing documents. They get in the way of justice. And justice is always lost where trade is concerned. We are both more than aware of that. In any case, it's my head. You won't be touched a bit. You couldn't have stopped me, even if you had known where we were going tonight. I wouldn't, Kanya starts. Don't worry about it. It's time that trade and its pet Ferang felt the sting here. They were complacent and needed a reminder that they still must perform the occasional crab to the idea of our laws. JD pauses, surveying the wreckage again. There's truly nothing else on the blacklist. Kanya shrugs. Just the rest. Everything else is innocuous in math on paper. No breeding specimens. No genetics in suspension. But? Much of it will be misused. Nutrient cultures can't have any good purpose. Kanya's back to her blank and depressed expression. Should we pack it all back up? J.D. grimaces, finally shakes his head. No. Burn it. I'm sorry? Burn it. We both know what's happening here. Give the Ferengs something to claim against their insurance companies. Let them know that their activity is not free. J.D. grins. Burn it all. Every last crate. And for the second time that night, as shipping crates cackle with fire, and whether all oils rush and ignite and kick sparks into the air like prayers going up to heaven, JD has the satisfaction of seeing Kanya smile again. And this is where stuff starts to tie into everyone else's stuff. It is nearly morning by the time JD returns home. The chi chi ching of the Jingjok wizards punctuate and creak as cicadas and and the high whine of mosquitoes. That the GGG of the Jingkok lizards punctuates the creak of cicadas and the high whine of mosquitoes. He slips off his shoes and climbs the steps, teak creaking under his feet as he steals into his stilt house, feeling the smooth wood under his soles, soft and polished against his skin. He opens the screened door and slips inside, closing the door quickly behind him. They're close to the they're close to the clone, only meters away, and the water is brackish and thick. The mosquitoes swarm close. Inside, a single candle burns illuminating Chea, where she lies on the floor, on, on a floor couch, asleep, waiting. He smiles tenderly and slips into the bathroom. No, slips into the bathroom to quickly disrobe and pour water over her shoulders. He tries to be quick and quiet about his bath, but water splatters, spatters flatly on the wood. He dips water again and spills it over his back. Even in the, dead, in the dead of night, the air is warm enough that he doesn't mind the water's slight chill in the hot season. Everything is a relief. When he comes out of his bath with the sarong wrapped around his waist, Shea is awake, looking up at him with thoughtful brown eyes. You're very late, she says. I was worried. J.D. grins. You should know better than to worry. I am a tiger. He nuzzles close to her, kisses her gently. Shaya grimaces and pushes him away. Don't believe everything the newspapers say. A tiger. 
She makes a face. You smell like smoke. I just bathed. It's in your hair. He rocks back on his heels. It was a very good night. She smiles in the darkness, her white teeth flashing, mahogany skin, a dull sheen in the in the black. Did you strike a blow for our queen? I struck a blow against trade. She flinches. Ah. He touches her arm. You used to be happy when I made when I made important people angry. She pushes away from him and stands, starts straightening the cushions. Her movements are abrupt, irritated. That was before. Now I worry about you. I'm surprised you bother to wait up. Oh, whoops. I worry about you. You shouldn't. JD moves out of her way as she finishes with the couch. I'm surprised you bother to wait up. If I were you, I would go to sleep and dream beautiful dreams. Everyone has given up on controlling me. I'm just a line item. A line item expense for them now. I'm too popular with people to do anything about. They put spies on me to watch me, but they do nothing to stop me anymore. A hero to the people and a thorn for the Ministry of Trade. I'd rather have Trade Minister Agra as a friend than and the people as your enemy. We'd be all be safer. You didn't think so when you married me. You liked that I was a fighter. That I had so many victories in Lumfini Stadium. You remember? She doesn't answer. Instead, begins rearranging the cushions again, refusing to turn around. JD sighs and puts a hand on her shoulder. Pulls her up to face him, so that she can, so that he can see her eyes. Anyway, why is it that you bring this up now? Am I not here? And perfectly fine? When they shoot you, when they shot you, you weren't so fine. That's in the past. Only because they put you behind a desk and Jenner Praka paid reparations. She holds up her hand, showing her own missing fingers. Don't tell me you're safe. I was there. I know what they can do. JD makes a face. We aren't safe in any case. If it's not trade, it's blister rust or sibisosis, or something else, something worse. We aren't living in a perfect world anymore. This isn't expansion. She opens her mouth to respond, then closes it and turns away. JD waits letting her master herself. When she turns back, her emotions are under control again. No, you're right. None of us are safe. I wish, though. You might as well run to Taprakchan market to get an amulet for all the good wishing does. I did. The one with Fra Su. Su. But you didn't wear it. But you don't wear it. Because it's just superstition. Whatever happens to me is my karma. A magic amulet isn't going to change that. Still, it doesn't hurt. She pauses. I would feel better if you wore it. JD smiles and starts to make a joke of it, but something in her expression makes him change his mind. Fine. If it makes you happy, I'll wear your fasu. From the sleeping room, a noise echoes. A wet coughing. JD stiffens. Shia shifts to look over her shoulder to the noise. It's Surat. Did you take him to Ratana? It's not her job to examine sick children. She has real work to do. Real gene hacks to worry over. Did you take him or not? Shia sighs. She said it's not an upgrade. Nothing to worry about. JD tries not to let his relief show. Good. The coughing comes again. It reminds him of Noom, dead and gone. He fights off sadness. Shia touches his chin, pulls his attention back to her, smiles up at him. So 
What is it that left you smelling a smoke, noble warrior, defender of Krumthep? Why so pleased with yourself? J.D. smiles slightly. You can read it in the whisper sheets tomorrow. She purses her lips. I'm worried about you. Really? That's because you have a good heart. But you shouldn't worry. They're done with heavy-handed measures against me. It went badly the last time. The papers and whisper sheets liked the story too much. And our most revered queen has registered her own support for what I do. They'll keep their distance. Her Majesty the Queen, at least, they still respect. You were lucky that she was allowed to hear you at all hear of you at all. Even the Hiya, the crown protector, can't blind her. Shea stiffens at his words. JD, please, not so loud. The son dead shall pray has too many years. JD makes a face. You see? This is what we've come to. A crown protector who spends his time meditating on how to take the inner apartments of the Grand Palace. A trade minister who conspires with Ferang to destroy our trade and quarantine laws. And meanwhile, we all try not to speak too loudly. I'm glad I went to the anchor pads tonight. You should have seen how much money those customs officers were waking in. Just standing aside and letting anything at all pass through. The next muti mutation of Sibisosis could have been sitting in vials right in front of them, and they would have they would have held out a hand for a bribe. Sometimes I think we're living the last days of of old Ayutthaya all over again. Don't be melodramatic. History repeats itself. No one fought to protect a Ay Ayutthaya that either. And so what does that make you? Some villager of Bang Rajan reincarnated, holding back the Farang tide, fighting to the last man, that sort of thing. At least they fought. Which would you rather be? The farmers who held off the Burmese army for a month, or the ministers of the kingdom who ran away and let their capital be sacked? He grimaces. If I were smart, I'd go to the anchor pads every night and teach Akarat and the Fereng a real lesson. Show them that someone's still willing to fight for Kung Thep. He expects Shea to try and shut him up again, to cool his hot-headed talk, but instead she is silent. Finally, she asks, Do you think our lives are always, re are always reborn here, in this place? Do we have to come back? and face all of this again, no matter what. I don't know, J.D. says. That's the sort of question Kanyo would ask. She's a dour one. I would get her an amulet too. Something that would make her smile for once. She's a bit, is a bit strange. I thought Ratana was going to propose to her. J.D. pauses, considering Kanya and pretty Ratana, with her breathing mask and her underground life in the ministry's biological containment labs. I don't, I don't pry into her private life. She'd smile more if she had a man. If someone as good as Ratana couldn't make her happy, then no man has a hope. J.D. grins. Anyway, if she had a man, he'd spend all his time being jealous of the men she commands in my unit. All the handsome men. He leans forward and tries to kiss Chaya, but she pulls away too quickly. Ah, you smell, you smell like whiskey, too. Whiskey and smoke. I smell like a real man. Go off to bed. You'll wake up Niwath and Surat. And mother. J.D. pulls her close, puts his lip to her ear. She wouldn't mind another grandchild. Shea pushes him away, laughing. She will wait. 
She will if you wake her up. His hands slip along her hips. I'll be very quiet. She slaps his hand away, but doesn't try real hard. He catches her and feels the stumps of her fingers, caresses the ridges. Suddenly, they're both solemn again. She takes a ragged breath. We've all lost too many things. I can't bear to lose you too. You won't. I am a tiger, and I am no fool. She holds him close. I hope so. I truly do. Her warm body presses against him. He can feel her breathing, it's steady, full of concern for him. She draws back and looks at him solemnly. Her eyes dark and full of care. I'll be fine, he says again. She nods, but doesn't seem to be listening. Instead, she seems to be studying him, following the lines of his brow, of his smiles, of his scars and pox. The movement seems to stretch forever, her dark eyes on him, memorizing, solemn. At last, she nods as though listening to something she tells herself, and her worried expression lifts. She smiles and pulls him close, pressing her lips to his ear. You are a tiger, she whispers, as if she is a fortune teller, pronouncing, and her body relaxes into him, pressing to him fully. He feels a rush of relief as they come together, finally. He clasps to him more tightly. I've missed you, he whispers. Come with me. She slips free, takes him by the hand, leads him toward their bed. She pulls aside the mosquito netting and slips under its, its tinting gossamer. Clothing rustles, falling away. A shadow woman teases him from within. You still smell like smoke, she says. Katie pulls aside the nets. And whiskey. Don't forget the whiskey. And that was chapter four. Which introduced a few different characters. Let me take a quick drink. This exercise on my throat. It's a little different than doing RPGs where you have other people to talk as well. Anyway, here we are. The sun peers over the rim of the earth, casting its blaze across Bangkok. It rushes molten over the wrecked tower bones of the old expansion and the cold. Ooh. Excuse me. It rushes over. It rushes molten over the wrecked tower bones of the old expansion and the gold-sheathed chedi of the city's temples. Chedi, chidi, chedi. Engulfing them in light and heat, it ignites the sharp high ro roof, roofs of the grand palace where the child queen lives, cloistered with her attendants and flames from the filigreed ornamentation uh, of the city pillar shrine where monks chant 24-7 on behalf of the city's sea walls and dikes. The blood-warm ocean flickers with blue mirror waves as the sun moves on, burning. The sun hits Anderson Lake's sixth-floor balcony and pours into his lap. Jasmine vines at the edge of the veranda rustle in the hot breeze. Anderson looks up. Blue eyes slitted against the glare. Sweat jewels pop and gleam on his pale skin. Beyond the rail, the city appears as, mol as a molten sea, glinting gold where spires and glass catch the full blaze of the sun. He's naked in the heat, seated on the floor, surrounded by open books, flora and fauna, catalogs, travel notes, 
an entire history of the southwest Asian peninsula scattered across teak. Moldy, crumbly tones. Scraps of paper, half-torn diaries, the excavated memories of a time when tens of thousands of plants lofted pollen and spores and seeds into the air. He has spent all night at work, and yet he barely remembers the many varietals he has examined. Instead, his mind returns to the flesh expo exposed, a foss returns to flesh exposed, a foss ends lighting up a girl's legs. legs. The memory of peacocks on a shimmering purple weave riding high, smooth thighs damply parted. In the far distance, the towers of Flowship Flowenchit stand tall, backlit. Three shadow fingers spiking skyward in a yellow haze of humidity. In the daylight, they just look more like expensive air slums, without a hint of the pulsing addictions contained within. A wind-up girl. His fingers on her skin, her dark eyes solemn as she said, You may touch. Anderson takes a shuddering breath, forcing away the memories. She is the opposite of the invasive plagues he fights every day. A hot house flower dropped into a world too harsh for her delicate heritage. It seems unlikely that she will survive for long, not in this climate, not with these people. Perhaps it was that vulnerability that moved him. Her pretended strength when she had nothing at all. Seeing her fight for a semblance of pride even as she hiked up her skirt at Raleigh's order. Is that why you told her about the villages? Because you pitied her? Not because her skin felt as smooth as mango. Not because you could, you could hardly breathe when you touched her? He grimaces and turns his attention again to his open books forcing himself to attend to his true problem, the question that has brought him across the world on clipper ships and dirigible. G. Busen. The wind-up girl said G. Busen. Anderson shuffles through the books and papers, comes up with a photograph. A fat man sitting with other Midwest scientists at an Agrogen-sponsored conference on blister rust mutation. He's looking away from the camera, bored, the waddles on his neck showing. Are you still fat, Anderson wonders. Do the ties feed you as well as we have, as well as we did? There were only three possibilities, Bowman, Gibbons, and Chondry. Bowman, who disappeared just before the soy pro, Monopoly broke. Shawed Hurry, who walked off a dirigible and disappeared into the Indian estates, either kidnapped by pure cow or run off, or dead. And Gibbons, G. Busen, the smartest of all of them, and the one deemed least likely. Dead, after all. His seared body recovered from the ashes of his home by his children, and then entirely cremated before the company could perform an autopsy, but dead. And when the children were questioned with lie detectors and drugs, all they could say was that their father had always been and had always insisted that he not be autopsy, that he couldn't abide anyone cutting into his corpse and pumping it full of preservatives, but the DNA matched. It was him. Everyone was sure it was him, except that it's easy to doubt when all you have are a few genetic clippings from the supposed corpse of the finest gene ripper in the world. Anderson shuffles through more papers, hunting up the transcripts of the calorie man's final days, cold from 
debugging devices they kept in the labs. Nothing. Not a hint of his plans. And then he was dead. And they were forced to believe it was true. And that way, the gnaw almost makes sense. The nightshades as well. Gibbons always enjoyed flaunting his expertise. An egoist. Every, every colleague said so. Gibbons would delight in playing with the full range of a complete seed bank. And an entire genus resurrected. And then a bit of local lore to top it off. No. At least Anderson assumes the fruit is local. But who knows? Perhaps it is an entirely new creation. Something sprung complete from Gibbon's mind, like Adam's rib spawning Eve. Anderson idly thumbs through the books and notes before him. None of them mention the all. All he has is a Thai word and its singular appearance. He doesn't even know if gnaw is a traditional moniker for the red and green fruit or something newly named. He had hoped that Raleigh would have his own recollections, but the man is old and adult on opium. If he knew an ungrit word for the historical fruit, it is lost to him now. In any case, there's no obvious translation. It will be at least a month before Des Moines can examine the sample, and there's no telling if it will if it will be their catalogs even then. If it's sufficiently altered, there may be no shortcut to a DNA match. One thing is certain: the null is new. A year ago, none of the inventory agents described anything of the sort in their ecosystem surveys. Between one year and the next. The gnaw appeared, as if the soil of the kingdom had simply decided to birth up the past and deposit it in the markets of Bangkok. Anderson thumbs through another book, Hunting. Since his arrival, he has been creating a library, a historical window into the city of divine beings. Tomes drawn from before the calorie wars and the plagues, before the contraction. He has pillaged through everything from antiquity shops to well, excuse me, from antiquity shops oops, lost my face, to the rubble of expansion towers. Most of the paper of that time has already burned or rotted in the human human tropics, but he has found pockets of learning even so. Families that valued their books more more than as even so, families that value their books more than as a quick way to start a fire. The accumulated knowledge now lines his walls. Volume after volume of mold-fringed information. And it depresses him, reminds him of Yeats. That desperate urge to excavate the corpse of the past and reanimate it. Think of it, Yates had crowed. A new expansion. Dirigibles, next gen, next gen king sprays, springs, fair trade winds. Yates had books of his own. Dusty tomes he had stolen from libraries and business schools across North America. The neglected knowledge of the past. A careful pillaging of Alexandria that had gone entirely unnoticed because everyone knew global trade was dead. When Anderson arrived, the books had, fill had filled the Spring Life offices and ranged around Yates' Yates's desk in stacks. Global management and practice, intellectual business, the Asian mind, the little tigers of Asia, supply chains and logistics, pop tie, the new global economy, exchange rate consideration and supply chains, ties mean bis business, international competition and regulation, anything and everything related to the history of the old expansion. Yates had pointed to them in his final moments of desperation and said, 
but we have it again, all of it. And then he had wept, and Anderson finally felt pity for the man. Yates had invested his life in something that would never be. Anderson flips through another book, examining ancient photographs in turn. Chilies, piles of them, laid out for some long dead photographer. Chilies, eggplants, tomatoes, all those wonderful nightshades again. If it hadn't been for the nightshades, Anderson wouldn't have been dispatched to the kingdom by the home office and Yates might have had a chance. Anderson reaches for his package of Singa hand-rolled cigarettes, lights one, and sprawls back, contemplative, examining the smoke of ancients. It amuses him that the ties, even amid starvation, have found time and energy to resurrect nicotine addiction. He wonders if human nature ever really changes. The sun glares in at him, bathing him with light through the humidity and haze of the burning dome. He can finally make out the manufacturing district in the distance, with its regularly spaced structures so different from the jumbled tiles and rust wash and rust wash of the old city, and beyond the factories. The realm of the seawall looms with its massive lock system that allows the shipment of goods out to sea. Change is coming. The return of truly global trade. Supply lines that circle the world. It's all coming back. Even if they slow at even if even if they're slow at relearning. Yates have had loved King Springs, but he he loved the idea of resurrected history even more. You aren't Agrigen here, you know. You're just another grubby furring entrepreneur trying to make a buck along with the jade pros prospectors and the clipper hands. This isn't India, where you can walk around flashing Agrigen's wheat crest and requisite, requisitioning whatever you want. The ties don't roll over like that. They'll cut you to pieces and send you back as meat if they find out what you find out what you are. You're out on the next hmm. So that was all I wish that you I wish it was more clear. That was all supposedly like Yates. You're out on the next dirigible flight, Anderson said. Be glad the main office even approved that. But then Yates had pulled the spring gun. Anderson draws again on his cigarette, irritated. He becomes aware of the heat. Overhead, his room's crank fan has come to a halt. The winding man, who is supposed to arrive every day at, at four in the afternoon, apparently didn't load enough jewels. Anderson grimaces and rises to pull the shades, blocking out the blaze. The building is a new one, built on thermal principles that allow cool ground air to circulate easily through the building, but it's still difficult to withstand the direct blaze of equatorial sun. Now in shadow, Anderson returns to his books, turns pages, flips through yellow tones and cracked spines, crumbling paper ill-treated by humidity and age. He opens another book, pinches a cigarette between his lips, squinting through the smoke and stops. No. Piles of them. The little red fruits with their strange green hair sit before him, mocking him within a photo of a farang bargaining for food with, with some long-ago Thai farmer. All around them, brightly colored, petroleum-burning taxis blur past, but just to their side, a huge pyramidal pile of gnaw stares, stares out of the photo, taunting. Anderson has spent enough time poring through the ancient pictures that 
face seldom affect him. He can usually ignore the foolish confidence of their past, the waste, the arrogance, the absurd wealth. But this one irritates him. The fat flesh hanging off, of, off the harangue, the astonishing abundance of calories that are so obviously secondary to the color and attractiveness of a market that has 30 varieties of fruit, mangosteens, pineapples, coconuts, certainly, but there are no oranges now. None of these, these dragon fruits, none of these pomelos, none of these yellow things, lemons, none of them. So many of these things are simply gone, but the people in this photo don't know it. These dead men and women have no idea they stand in front of the treasure of the ages, that they inhabit the Eden of the Grahamite Bible, where pure souls go to live at the right hand of God, where all flavors of the world reside under careful attentions of Noah and St. Francis, and where no one starves. Anderson scans the ca caption. The fat, self-contented fools have no idea of the genetic mold, gold mine they stand beside. The book doesn't even bother to identify them all. It's just another example of nature's fesundity, taken entirely for granted because they enjoyed so damn much of it. Anderson briefly wishes wishes that he could that he could drag the fat farang an ancient Thai farmer out of the photograph and into the present so that he could express his rage at them directly before tossing them off his balcony the way they undoubtedly tossed aside fruit that was even the slightest bit bruised. He flips through the book but finds no other images nor mentions of the kinds of fruits available. He straightens, agitated, and goes to the balcony again steps out into the sun, sun's blaze and stares across the city. From below, the calls of water sellers and the cry of megadons echo up. The chime of bicycle bells streaming across the city. By noon, the city will be largely stirred, waiting for the sun to begin its descent. It will be largely stilled. It's not stirred. Somewhere in this city, a gene ripper is busily toying, toying with the building blocks of life, regenerating long extinct DNA to fit post-contraction circumstances to survive despite the assaults of blister rush, rust, meepon, gene hack, weevil, and sibisosis. Ji Bu Sen. The wind-up girl is certain of the name. It has to be Givens. Anderson leans on the balcony's rail, squinting into the heat, surveying the tangled city. Gibbons is out there, hiding, crafting his next triumph, and whatever he wherever he hides, a seed bank will be close. Welcome back. I've always been here. How are you feeling? Good. How are you? My, my throat exercising. Um, we're close to the halfway point. Do you want to take an early break or keep going and then break? Uh, let me check this chapter. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that. I said, let me check this chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can take an early break. Okay. Well, in five minutes, everybody, we will be back shortly. Five minutes. Five.
Hello. Hi, folks. We're back from the break. Me just needed to just needed to get a little bite. Okay. Chapter six. Oh, I'm on chapter six. The problem with keeping money in a bank is that in the blink of a tiger's eye, it will turn on you. What's yours becomes theirs. What was your sweat and labor and sold off portions of a lifetime become a stranger's? This problem, this banking problem, gnaws at the forefront of Hawk Sandy's mind. A gene hack weevil that he cannot dig out and cannot pinch into, into pus and exoskeleton fragments. Oh, gene hack weevil is some kind of insect. Gross. Imagined in terms of the of the time, time spent earning wages that a bank then holds. A bank can own more than half of a man. Well, at least a third. Even if you're even if you are a lazy tie, and a man without one third of his life, in truth, has no life at all. Which third can a man lose? The third from his chest to the top of his balding skull. From his waist to his yellowing toenails. Two legs and an arm, two arms and a head. A quarter of a man cut away might still hope to survive, but a third is too much to tolerate. This is the problem with the, with the bank. As soon as you place your money in its mouth, it turns out that the tiger has gotten its teeth locked around your hand. One third, or one half, or just a liver spotted skull. It might as well be all. But if a bank cannot be trusted, what can? A flimsy lock on a door? The ticking of a mattress carefully unstuffed? The ravaged tiles of a rooftop lifted up and wrapped in banana leaves, a cutaway in, in the bamboo beams of a slum shack, cleverly sliced open and hollowed to hold the fat rolls of bills that he shoves into them. Hawk Sang digs into bamboo. The man who rented the room called it a flat, and in a way it is. It has four walls, not just not just a tinting coconut polymer tarps. It has a tiny courtyard behind where the outhouse lies and which he shares along with the walls. The six other huts. For yellow card refugee, this is not a f this is not a flat, but a mansion. And yet all around he hears the groaning and complaining mass of humanity. The weather all wooden walls are frankly an extravagance, even if they don't quite touch the ground. Even if the jute sandals of his neighbors peek underneath, and even if they reek with the embedded oils that keep them from rotting in the humidity of the tropics. But they are necessary, if only to provide places to store his money. Uh, to store his money other than the bottom of his rain barrel. Wrapped in three of uh, To store his money other than the bottom of his rain barrel wrapped in three layers of dog hide that he prays may still be waterproof after six months of immersion. Hawk Sang pauses in his labors, listening. Rustling comes from the next room but nothing indicates that anyone eavesdrops on his mouse-like burrowing. He returns to the process of loosening a disguised bamboo panel at its joint, carefully saving the sawdust for later. Nothing is certain. That is the first lesson. The Yangweezy foreign devils learned this in the contraction when their loss of oil sent them scuttling back to their home shores. He himself finally learned it in Malacca. Nothing is certain. Nothing is secure. A rich man becomes a poor man. A noisy, ch a noisy Chinese family, fat and happy, during spring festival, f 
fed well on pork strips. Nasi goreng and Hainan style chicken becomes a single emaciated yellow card. Nothing is eternal. The Buddhists understand this much, at, le at least. Hok Sang grins mirthlessly and continues his quiet burrowing, following a line across the top of a of the panel, digging out more of digging out more packed sawdust. He now lives in the height of luxury with his packed mosquito net and his little burner that can ignite green methane twice a day if he's willing to pay the local the local pyene elder elder brother for an illegal tap into the city's lamppost delivery pipes. He has his own set of clay rain urns sitting in the tiny courtyard on an, astand an astounding luxury in itself. Protected by the honor and uprightness of his neighbors, the desperately poor who know that there must be limits to anything, and every squalor and debauch has limits. And so, he has rain barrels full of green slime, of green slime mosquito eggs that he can assure himself will never be stolen from. Even if he may have, he may be murdered outside his door, or his neighbor wife may be raped by a Nak Lang who takes a fancy to her. Hawk Sing prize at the Hawksing prize at the tiny pan panel in the bamboo strut, holding his breath, trying to make no scraping sound. He chose this place for its exposed joints and the tiles overhead in the low dark ceiling for the nooks and crannies and opportunities. All around him, the slum inhabitants wake and groan and complain and light their cigarettes as he sweats with the tension of opening his this hiding place. It's foolish to keep so much money here. If the slum, what if the slum burns? What if the weather all catches fire from some fool's candle overturn? What if the mobs come and attempt to trap him inside? Hawk Sang pauses, wipes the sweat from his brow. I am crazy. No one is coming for me. The green headbands are across the border in Malaya, and the kingdom's armies will keep them well away. And even if they do come, I have an archipelago's worth of distance to prepare for their arrival. Days of travel on King's spring train. Even if the rails aren't blown away by the King Queen Army's generals, 24 hours at least, even if they use coal for their attack. And otherwise, weeks of marching, plenty of time. I am safe. The panel comes open completely in his shaking hand, revealing the bamboo's hollow interior. The tube is watertight, perfected by nature. He sends a skinny arm questing into the hole, feeling blind. For a moment, he thinks someone has taken it, robbed him while he was gone, but then his fingers touch paper, and he fishes up rolls of cash one by one. In the next room, Sunan and Molly are discussing, their, or discussing her uncle, who wants them to smuggle CB11S8 pineapples sneaking them in a skiff from the Fring quarantine island of Koh Angri. Quick money. If they're, willing, if they're willing to take the risk of bringing in banned food stock from the calorie monopolies. Hawks in, listens to them mutter as he stuffs his own cash into an envelope, then tucks it inside his shirt. Diamonds, bat, and jade. And jade pit his pit his walls are all around but still it hurts to take this money now it goes against his hoarding instinct he presses the bamboo panel close again takes a spit and mixes it with the meager sawdust that remains and presses the compound into the visible cracks he rocks back on his heels and examines the bamboo pole it is nearly invisible if he didn't know to count upwards four joints, he wouldn't know where to look, or 
what to look for. The problem with banks is that they cannot be trusted. The problem with secret ca uh, caches cash is that they are hard to protect. The problem with a room in a slum is that anyone can take the money when he is gone. He needs other caches. Safe, safe places to hide the opium and jewels and cash he procures. He needs a safe place for everything, for him safe, for himself as well. And for that, any amount of money is worth spending. All things are transient. Buddha says it is so. And Hawk Sang, who didn't believe in or care about karma or the truths of the, of the Dharma when he was young, has come in his old age to understand his grandmother's religion and its painful truths. Suffering is his lot. Attachment is the source of his suffering, and yet he cannot stop himself from saving and preparing and striving to preserve himself in this life, which has turned out so poorly. How is it that I, how is it that I sinned to earn this bitter fate? Saw my clan whittled by red machetes. Saw my businesses burned and my clipper ships sunk. He closes his eyes, forcing memories away. Regret is suffering. He takes deep breaths and climbs stiffly to his feet, surveys the room to ascertain that nothing is out of place, then turns and shuts his door open, wood scraping on dirt, and slips into the, sque into the squeezeway that is the slum's thoroughfare. He secures the door with a bit of leather twine, a knot, and nothing else. The room has been broken into before. It will be broken into again. He plans on it. A big lock would attract the wrong attention. A poor man's bit of leather entices no one. The way out of the Yawarit slum is full of shadows and squatting bodies. The heat of the dry season presses down on them. So intense that it seems that it seems no one can breathe. Even with the looming presence of the Shao Freya dikes. No, there is no escape from the heat. If the seawall gave way, the entire slum would drown in nearly cool water. But until then, Hoxing sweats and stumbles through the maze of squeezeways, rubbing up against scavenged tin walls. He jumps across open gutters of shit, balances on planks, and slips past women, sweating over steaming pots of Utex. Of Utex glass noodles, and reeking sun-dried fish. A few kitchen carts, ones who have bribed either the white shirts or the slums Pylian, burn small dung fires in public, choking the alleys, alleys with thick smoke and frying chili oil. He squeezes around triple-locked bicycles, stepping, carefu stepping carefully Clothes and cook pots and garbage spill out from under tarp walls, encroaching on public space. The walls rustle in the movement of people within. A man coughing in the last sta stages of lung water. A woman complaining about her son, Lao Lao rice, son's Lao Lao rice wine habit. A little girl threatening to hit her baby brother. Privacy is not something for a tarp slum, but the walls provide polite illusion, and certainly it is better than the ex expansion tower and internments of the yellow cards. A tarp slum is a luxury for him, and with native ties all around, he has cover. Better protection than he ever enjoyed in Malaya. Here he doesn't open his mouth and betray his foreign accent. He could be mistaken for a local. Still, he misses that place where he and his family he misses that place where he and his family were alien and yet had forged a life. He misses the marbled floor halls, the red liqueur pillars of his ancestral home, ringing with the calls of his children and grandchildren and servants. He misses Hainan, Hainan chicken and laksa asan, and good sweet kopi and roti kanai. 
he misses his clipper fleet and his crews. And isn't it true that he hired uh Yeah, and isn't it true that he hired even the brown people for his crews? Even had them as captains. So yeah, everybody's racist in the book. Who sail who sailed his Mishimoto clippers to the far side of the world, sailing as far as Europe, carrying tea strains resistant to gene hack weevil, and returning with expensive cognacs that had not been seen since the days of the expansion, and in the and in the evenings he returned to his wives and ate well, and worried that only that a son was not diligent or that a daughter would find a good husband. How silly and ignorant he had been. He fancied himself a sea trader, and yet understood so little of the turning tides. A young girl emerges from under a tar flat. She smiles at him, too young to know him for a stranger, and too innocent yet to care. She is alive, burning with the limber vitality that an old man can only envy, and with every aching bone, she smiles at him. She could be his daughter. A little insight into Hawk's hang. Malaya's night was black and sticky, a jungle filled with the squawks of night birds and the pulse and whir of insect life. Dark harbor waters lapped before them. He and fourth daughter, he and fourth, oh, where am I? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, has nine. Yeah, this is a flashback. Dark waters lap before him. He and fourth daughter, that useless waif, the only one he could preserve, hid among piers and rocking boats, and when darkness fell completely, he guided her down to the water to where waves rushed onto the beach in steady surges, and the stars overhead were pinpricked to gold and blackness. Look back, go, she whispered. There were times when he told her that every star was a bit of gold that was hers for the taking, because she was Chinese, and with hard work and attendance to her ancestors and traditions, she would prosper. And now, here they were, under a blanket of gold dust, Milky Way spread before them like great, like a great shifting blanket. The stars, so thick that if they were tall enough, could reach up and sque and squeeze them and have them run down his arms. Gold all around, and all of it untouchable. Amid the lapping of fishing boats and little spring craft, he found a rowboat and pulled for deep water, aiming for the bay following the currents, a black speck on the shifting reflections of the ocean. He would have preferred a cloudy night, but at least there was no moon, and so he pulled and pulled, while all around them, sea carp surfaced and rolled, and rolled, showing the fat pale bellies that people of his clan had engineered to feed a starving nation. He pulled on the oars, and the carp surrounded them, showing bloated stomachs, now thickened on the blood and gristle of their creators. And then the little boat was alongside the object of his search. A trimaran anchored in the deep, the place, the place where Hafiz's boat people slept. He climbed aboard and slipped silent among them, studying them all as they slept soundly, protected by their religion safe and alive, while well, he had nothing. His arms and shoulders and back ached from the strain of rowing, an old man's aches, a soft man's pains. He slipped among them, searching too old for, for the nonsense of survival and yet unable to give up. He might still survive. The one daughter mouth might survive, even if she, even if she was a girl child. Even if she would do nothing for her ancestors. At least she was of his clan. A clipping of DNA that still might be saved. 
Finally, he found the body he wanted, leaned down to touch it gently, covered the man's mouth. Old friend, he whispered. The man's eyes went wide as he woke. Unique thought. He nearly saluted, even half naked and lying on his back. And then, as if recognizing the change in the change in their fortunes, his hand fell back and he addressed Hawk Singh as he never dared in real life. Hawk Singh, you are still alive. Hawk Singh pursed his lips. This useless daughter mouth and I need to go north. I need your help. Hafiz sat up, rubbing his eyes. He glanced furtively at the rest of his sleeping clan. He whispered, If I turn you in, I would make a fortune. The head of three prosperities, I would be rich. You were not poor when you worked for me. Your head is worth more than all the Chinese skulls stacked in the streets of Penang, and I would be safe. Hawk Singh started to respond angrily, but Hafiz put his hand up, indicating silence. He ushered Hawk Singh to the edge of the deck against the rail. He leaned close, his lips nearly touching Hawk Singh's ear. Do you not know the danger you bring on me? Some of my own family wear green headbands now, my own sons. It is not safe here. Think this is something I learned just learned now? Hafiz had the grace to look away, embarrassed. I cannot help you. Hawk Singh grimaced. Is it is this what my kindness to you has earned? Did I not attend your wedding, gift you and run away? Feet you for ten days? Did I not pay for Muhammad's admission to college and kill? You did that and more. My debts to you are great, Hafiz bowed his head. But we are not the men we were before. The green headbands are everywhere among us. And those of us who loved the yellow plague can only suffer. Your head would buy my family security. I'm sorry, it is true. I do not know why I don't strike you now. I have diamonds and j I have diamonds, jade. Hafiz sighed and turned away, showing his broad muscled back. If I took your jewels, I would just as quickly be tempted to take your life. If we speak of money, then your head must always be the most valuable prize. Best not to discuss the temptations of wealth. So this is how we end. Hafiz turned back to Hawksane, pleading. Tomorrow, I will give your clipper ship Dawnstar to them and forswear you utterly. If I were smart, I would turn you in as well. All the ones who have aided the Yellow Plague are suspected now. We who fattened on Chinese industry and thrived under your generosity are the most hated in our new Malaya. The country is not the same as it was. People are hungry. They are angry. They call, they call us all calorie pirates, profiteers, and yellow dogs. There is nothing to quell it. Your blood is already shed, but they have yet to decide what to do with us. I cannot risk my family for you. You could sail with us, sail together. A peace side. The green headbands already sail the coast, searching for refugees. Their net is wide and deep, and they slaughter those they catch. But we are clever, more clever than they. We could slip past. No, it is impossible. How do you know? Hafiz looked away, embarrassed. embarrassed. My sons boast to me. Hot Singh scowled bitterly, holding his daughter's hand. Hafiz said, I'm sorry, my shame will go with me until I die. He turned abruptly and hurried f and hurried for the galley. He returned with unspoiled mangoes and papaya. 
a bag of Utex, a pure cow, CB melon. Here, take these. I'm sorry, I can do no more. I am sorry. I have to think of my own survival as well. And with that, he ushered Hawksing off the boat and out into the waves. A month later, Hawksing crossed the border alone, crawling through leech infested jungle after being abandoned by the snakeheads who betrayed them. Hawksing has heard that those who helped the yellow people later died in droves, plunging some from cliffs into the sea to swim as best they could for the shore smashing rocks or shot where they floated. He wonders if Hafiz was one of those to die, or if his or if his gift of the last of three prosperities, unscuttled clippers, was enough to save his family. If his green headband son spoke for him, or if they watched coldly as their father suffered for his many, many sins. Huh? So that's dark, yo. Yeah. And and it's it's interesting to see how nobody in this in this book is innocent. Um, because when Hawksang was rich, he like his people like his people were starving, and. So he, you, he and the people he had working for him lived well, but not everybody else. Grandfather, are you well? The little girl touches Hawksing gently on the wrist, watching him with wide black eyes. My mother can get you oil of water if you need to drink. Hawksing starts to speak, then simply nods and turns away. If he speaks to her, she will know him as a refugee, but that he's best he simply blend in. Best not to reveal that he lives among them at the whim of white shirts and the dung lord, and a few faked stamps on his yellow card. Best to trust no one, even if they seem friendly. A smiling girl one day is a girl with a stone bashing in the brains of a baby the next. I like his imagination. This is the only truth. One can think there are such things as loyalty and trust and kindness, but they are devil cats. In the end, they are only they are only smoke and cannot be grasped. Another ten minutes of twisting passages carry some close to the city seawalls where hovels attach themselves like barnacles to the ramparts of revered King Rama, the, the twelfth blueprint for the survival of the city. Oxang finds Laughing Chan sitting beside a jock cart, a jock cart, eating a steaming bowl of Utex rice porridge with small bits of unidentifiable meat buried in paste. In his laugh life, life, Laughing Chan was a plantation overseer, tapping the trunks of rubber trees to capture latex drippings, a crew of 150 under him. In this life, his, his flair for organization has found a new niche. Running laborers to unload Megadons and Clipper ships down on the docks and out on the anchor pads when ties are too lazy or thick or slow, or he can bribe someone higher up to let his yellow card crew have the right. And sometimes he does other work as well. Moves opium and amphetamine and and amphetamine yaba from the river into the Dung Lord's very own towers. Slips agrogen soy pro in from Koangreet despite the environment ministry's blockades. He's missing an ear and four teeth, but that doesn't stop him from smiling. He sits and grins like a vole and shows the gaps in his teeth, and all the while his eyes roam over the passing pedestrian traffic. 
Ha Tseng sits in another bowl of steaming jock is set before him, and they eat the Utex gruel with, with coffee that is almost as good as what they used to drink down south. And all the while, both of them watch the people all around, their eyes following the, following the woman who serves them from her pot, from her pot. The men crouched at the other tables in the alley, the commuters squeezing past with their bicycles. The two, the two of them are yellow cards, after all. It is much in their na nature as Cheshire's, as a Cheshire's, Cheshire's search for birds. You are ready, Laughing Chin asks. A little longer yet. I don't want your men to be seen. Don't worry. We almost walk like, like ties now. He grins in his gap show. We are going native. You know dog fucker? Laughing Chan nods sharply and his smile disappears. And Sukri knows me. I will be below the seawall village side, out of sight. I have Ah Ping and Peter Siu to watch close. Good then. Hoxing finishes his jock and pays for Laughing Chan's food as well. With Laughing Chan and his men nearby, Hoxing feels a little better, but still, it is a risk, and if things go wrong, Laughing Chan will be too far away to do much more than effect vengeance. And really, when Hoxing thinks about it, he isn't sure he has paid enough for that. Laughing Chan saunters off, slipping between tarp structures. Hawk Sang continues to continues on through a, the stagnant heat to the excuse me stagnant heat to the steep rough path that runs up the side of the seawall. He climbs up through the slums, his knee aching with every step. Eventually, he reaches the high, broad embankment of the city's tidal defenses. After the sheltered stink of the slums, the sea breeze rushing over him and tugging at his clothes, it is a relief. The bright blue ocean reflects like a mirror. Others stand on the embankment's promenade, 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 taking the, fre taking the fresh air. In the distance, one of King Rama II's coal pumps squats like a massive toad in the embankment's edge, the symbol of Korokot. The crab is visible in its metal hide. Steam and smoke gout from its stacks and steady puffs. Somewhere, deep underground, organized by the genius of, of the king, the pumps send their, send their tendrils and suck water from beneath so that the, so that the city will not drown. Even in the hot season, seven pumps run, run steadily, keeping Bangka Bangkok from being swallowed. In the rainy season, all 12 of the, of the zodiac, zodiac signs run as the rain drenches, drenches down and everyone pulls the, the thoroughfares of the city and skiffs, skin soaked, grateful that the monsoon hasn't failed and that the seawalls haven't broken. He makes his way down the other side and out on a dock. A farmer with a skiff full of coconuts offers him one. Slashing open the green top for Hawksang to drink. Across the waters, the drowned buildings of Thornbury poke up through the waves. Skiffs and fishing nets and clipper ships slip back and forth in the water Hoxang takes a deep breath, sucking the smell of salt and fish and seaweed deep into his lungs. The life of the ocean. A Japanese clipper slides past, palm oil polymer hull, and high white sails like a gull's. The hydrofoil package below, below it is still hidden, but since it's out on the water, it will use it will use a spring cam to launch its high sails, and then the ship will heap up from the water like a fish. Hawk Sang remembers standing on the deck of his own first clipper, its high sails flying, 
slashing across the ocean like a stone skipped by a child, clapping as they tore over the waves. As spray rushed and, bl rushed and blasted him, he had turned to his number one wife and told her that all things were possible, that the future was theirs. He settles himself on the shoreline and drinks the rest of the green coconut water while a bigger boy watches. Oxen beckons. This one is smart enough, he supposes. He likes to reward the smart ones, the ones who are patient enough to linger and see what he will do with the coconut husk. He hands it to the boy. The boy takes it with a lie and goes to smash it on mortared stones at the top of the seawall. When he squats, then then he squats and uses and uses a scrap of oyster shell to scrape the slimy tender meat from the interior, starving. Eventually, Dogfucker arrives. That's what they've been calling him. His real name is Sukrit Kamsing, but Hawk Singh seldom hears the man's true name on the lips of yellow cards. There is too much bile and history built up. Instead, it's always Dogfucker and the words drip with hate and fear. He's a squat man, full of calories and muscle, as perfect for his work as a Megadon is for converting calories into jewels. The scars on his hands and arms show pale. The slits where his nose once stood stare at Hawksang, two dark vertical nostrils, nostril slashes that give him a horsing appearance. There is some argument among yellow cards about whether Dogfucker let, Fi let Fagan r run too long, allowing its cauliflower growth to send enough tendrils deep into his flesh that doctors were forced to chop the whole thing off to save his life, or if Doglord simply took his Dunglord simply took his nose to teach him a lesson. Dogfucker squats beside Hawksang, hard black eyes. Your doctor, Chan, came to me with a letter. Hawksang nods. I want to meet with your patron. Dogfucker laughs lightly. I broke her fingers and fucked her, and fucked her dead for interrupting my nap. Hawksang keeps his face impassive. Maybe Dogfucker is lying. Maybe he is telling the truth. It is impossible to know. Regardless, it is a tease to see if Hawksang will flinch, to see if he will bargain. Perhaps Dr. Chan is gone, another name to weigh him down when he finally reincarnates. Hawksang says, your patron will look favorably on the offer, I think. Dogfucker scratches absently at, at the slit of a nostril. Why not meet me at my office instead? I like open places. You have people around here. More yellow cards. I think they'll make you safe. You think they'll make you safe. Hawksang shrugs. He looks out at the ships and their sails, at the wide world beckoning. I want to offer you and your patron a deal. A mountain of profit. Tell me what it is. Hawksang shakes his head. No. I must speak with him in person, him only. He doesn't talk to yellow cards. Maybe I'll just feed you to the red fa red fin flower out there, just like the green head fence did with your kind down south. You know who I am. I know who your letter says you were. Dogfucker rubs at the edges of his, of his nose slits, studying Hawksang. Here, you're just another yellow card. Hawksang doesn't say anything. He hands the hemp sack of money across to Dogfucker. Dogfucker eyes it suspiciously, suspiciously, doesn't take it. What is it? A gift. Look and see. Dogfucker is curious, but also cautious. It's a good thing to know. He isn't the sort to put his hand in a bag and come up with a scorpion. Instead, he loosens the sack and dumps it. Bundles of cash spill out. Roll into, roll into the shells and dirt of low tide. 
Dog fucker's eyes widen. Fox saying keeps himself from smiling. Tell the young lord that Tan Fox Sing, head of Three Prosperities Trading Company, has a business proposal. Deliver my note to him, and you will also profit greatly. Dogfucker smiles. I think perhaps I'll simply take this money, and my bin will beat you, beat you until you tell me where you hide all your paranoid yellow hard cash. Oxing doesn't say anything, keeps his face impassive. Dogfucker says, I know all about Laughing Chen's people here. He owes me for his disrespect. Oxing is surprised that he feels no fear. He lives in fear of all things, but thuggish Pai Lian, like Dogfucker, are not what fill his nights with terror. In the end, Dogfucker is a businessman. He is not a white shirt, puffed on national pride or hungry f for a little more respect. Dogfucker works for money, acts for money. He and Hawk Sing are different parts of the economic organ organism, and underneath everything, they are brothers. Hawk Sing smiles slightly as confidence builds. This is just a gift for your trouble. What I propose will provide much more. For all of us. He takes out the last two items. One, a letter. Give it to your master, sealed. The other hand, he hands across a small box with its familiar universal spindle, embraces a palm oil polymer, casting in a dull shade of yellow. Dogfucker takes the object, turns it over. A kink spring? He makes a face. What's the point of this? Hawk Sing smiles. He'll know when he reads the letter. He stands and turns away without even waiting for Dogfucker to respond. Feeling stronger and more assured than any time since the green headbands came and his warehouse went up in smoke and his clipper ships went sliding down into the ocean depths. In this moment, Hawk Sang feels like a man. He walks straighter, his limp forgotten. It's impossible to know if Dogfucker's people will follow him, and so he walks slowly, knowing that both Dogfucker's and Laughing Chan's men surround him, a floating ring of surveillance, as he works his way down the alleys and cuts into deeper slums, until at last Laughing Chan is there, waiting for him, smiling. They let you go, he says. Hok Sing pulls out more money. You did well. He knows it was your men, though. He gives Laughing Chin an extra roll of pot. Pay him off with this. Laughing Chin smiles at the pile of money. This is twice what I need for that. Even Dogfucker likes to use us when he doesn't want to risk smuggling soy pro over concrete. Take it anyway. Laughing Chin shrugs and pockets it. It's very kind of you. With the anchor pad shut down, we can use the extra bot. Hoxing is turning away, but at Laughing Chan's words, he turns back. What do you say about the anchor pads? They're shut down. White shirts raided them last night. Everything's locked tight. What happened? Laughing Chan, Chan shrugs. I heard they burned everything, sent it all up in smoke. Hoxing doesn't pause to ask anymore. He turns and runs as fast as his old bones can carry him, cursing himself all the way, cursing that he was a fool and didn't put his nose to the wind, that he let himself be distracted from their survival by the urgent wish to do something more, to reach ahead. Every time he makes plans for his future, he seems to fail. Every time he reaches forward, the world leans against him, pressing him down. On Thanon, Tannen succumbit. In the sweat of the sun, he finds a new vendor. He fumbles through newspapers and the hand cranked whisper sheets of rumor through through luck pages, through luck pages, advertising good numbers for gambling and names of predicted Muay Thai champions. Muay Thai. Muay Thai. Muay Thai. Muay Thai champions. 
I think that is how it's pronounced. He tears them open, one after another, more frantic with every copy. All of, all of them show the smiling face of J.D. Rajanasuchai, the incorruptible tiger of Bangkok. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. Let's come full circle. Yeah. It'll be like that. For lots of things through most of the book. Mm. Lots of things. What time are we at? How Two many? hours. Two hours. Okay. What kind of voice did JD have again? I'm famous. JD holds the whisper sheet picture up beside his own face, grinning at Kanya. When she doesn't smile, he puts it back on in its rack, along with all the rest of, the, of his pictures. Eh, you're right. It's not really a good likeness. They must have bribed it out of our records department, he sighs wistfully. But I was young then. Still, Kanya doesn't respond. Just stares morosely at the water of the Kwong. They've spent the day hunting for skiffs, smuggling pure cow and agrogen cops up the river, sailing back and forth across the river's river mouth, and JD still thrums with a certain exhilaration. The prize of the day was a clipper ship anchored just off the docks. Ostensibly, an Indian trading vessel sail, sailed from Bali. It turned out to be brimming with Sibisosis resistant pineapples. It was satisfying to see the harbor master and the ship's captain both stammering, both stammering excuses while JD's white shirts poured lie over the entire shipment, crate after crate, rendered sterile and inedible. All that smuggling profit gone. He flips through the other papers, attached to the display boards, finds a different image of himself, this one from his time as a Muay Thai competitor, laughing after a fight in Lumfini Stadium. The Bangkok M Morning Post. My boys will like this one. He opens the paper and scans the story. Trade Minister Akrat is, is spitting mad. The quotes from the trade ministry call J.D. a vandal. J.D. is surprised they don't call him a traitor or a terrorist. That they restrain themselves. Tell that they restrain themselves tells him just how impotent they really are. J.D. can't help smiling over, over the pages at Kanya. You really hurt them. Again, Kanya doesn't respond. There's a certain trick to ignoring her bad moods. The first time JD met Kanya, he almost thought she was stupid. The way her face remained so impassive, so impervious to any hint of fun, as though she were missing an organ. A nose for smell, eyes for sight, or whatever curious organ makes a person sense Sanuk when it is right in front of them. We, we should get, we should be getting back to the ministry, she says, turns to scan the boat traffic along the calm, looking for an impossible ride. JD pays the whisper sheet man for the paper as a canal taxi glides into view. Kanya flags it and slides up, up beside them. Its flywheel whining with accumulated power, waves sloshing the calm wave sloshing the clone embankment as its weight catches up. Huge kink springs. Kink springs crowd half its displacement. Wealthy Chaozu Chinese business people cram the covered prow of the boat like ducks on their way to slaughter. Kanya and JD jump on board aboard and stand on and stand on the running board outside the seating compartment 
the seating compartment. The ticket child ignores their white shirt uniforms just as they ignore her. She, sell, she sells a 30 bought ticket to another man who boards with them. JD grabs a safety line as the boat accelerates away from the dock. Wind caresses his face as they make their way down the clong, aiming for the heart of the city. The boat moves quickly, zipping around small paddled skiffs and long tail boats in the canal. Blocks of dilapidated houses and shop fronts slide past. Fasin blouses and sarong hang colorful in the sun. Women bathe their long black hair in the brown waters of the canal. The boat slows abruptly. Kanya looks forward. What is it? Up ahead, a tree has fallen, blocking much of the canal. Boats jam around it, trying to squeeze past. A blue tree, J.D. says. He looks around for landmarks. We'll have to let the monks know. No one else will move it. And despite the shortage of wood, no one will harvest it either. It would be unlucky. Their boat wallows as the clong traffic tries to slip through the tiny gap left in the canal, where the sacred tree has, n has not blocked movement. JD makes a noise of impatience and calls ahead. Clear out, friends. Ministry business. Clear the way. He waves his badge. The sight of the badge and his bright white uniform is enough to get boats and skiffs pulling aside. The pilot of their taxi flashes JD a grateful look. Their kink spring craft slips into, into the press, jostling for space as they ease around the bare branches of the tree. The clone taxi's passengers all make deep wise of respect to the fallen trunk pressing their palms together and touching them to their foreheads. J.D. makes his own wide, then reaches out to touch the wood, letting his fingers slide over the riddled surface as they pass. Small boreholes speckle it. If he were to peel away the bark, a fine, a fine net of grooves would, des would describe the tree's death. A bow tree. Sacred. The tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment. And yet they could do nothing to save it. Not a single varietal of fig survived, despite their best efforts. The ivory beetles were too much for them. When the scientists failed, they prayed to Phra Sud a last desperate effort, but even the martyr couldn't save them in the end. We couldn't save everything, Kanya murmurs, seeming to read his thoughts. We couldn't save even one thing, JD lets his fingers slide along the grooves where the ivory beetle did its work. The Ferengi have so much to answer for, and yet still Akarat seeks to treat with them. Not with Agrigen. JD smiles bitterly and pulls his hand away from the fallen tree. No, not with them, but they're ilk nonetheless. Gene rippers, calorie men, even pure cow when the famines are worst. Why else do they let them squat out on coal on grit in case we need them, in case we fail and must go begging for their rice and wheat and soy? We have our own gene rippers now, thanks to His Royal Majesty King Rama the Twelfth Foresight and Shao Preya, Ji Bu Sen. Shao Preya, J JD makes a face. No, no one that evil should be graced with such a respectful title. Yeah. No one that evil should be graced with a respectful title. Kanya shrugs, but doesn't bait him. Soon the bow tree is behind them. At, Shrina, at Shrinakarin Bridge, they disembark. The smell of food, of food stalls calls to JD. 
He motions Kanye to follow as he makes his way into a tiny soy. Some chai says there's good sontan cart down here. Good clean papayas, he tells he tells me. I'm not hungry, Kanya says. That's why you're always in such a terrible mood. JD. Kanya starts, then stops. JD glances back at her, catches the worried expression on her face. What is it? Come on then. I'm worried about the anchor pads. JD shrugs. Don't. Up ahead, food carts and tables cluster along the walls of the alley, all jammed together. Small bowls of non prick sit tidily in the centers of the scavenged table planks. You see, some chai is right. He finds the salad cart. He wants to examine. He he wants and examines the spices and fruits and fruits. Starts ordering for both of them. Kanya comes up beside. A compact cloud of dark mood. 200,000 baht is a lot of money for Akara to lose. 200,000 baht is a lot of money for Akara to lose, she mutters as JD tells him, tells the Samtam vendor to add more chilies. JD nods thoughtfully as the woman stirs the threads of green papaya into the mix of spices. It's... It's true. I had no idea there was so much money being made out there. It's enough to finance a new lab for gene root research, or put 500 white shirts on its inspection in the tilapia farms of Thornbury. He shakes his head. And this was just one raid. It's amazing to him. There are times when he thinks he understands how the, the world works, and then, every so often, he lifts the lid of some new part of the Divine City and finds roaches scuttling where he never expected. Something new indeed. He goes to the next food cart, stacked with trays of chili-laden pork and red star bamboo tips. Fried snake head plow, battered and crisped, pulled from the Shao Freya, Shao Freya, Freya River. Fried snake head, oh, pulled from the Shao Freya River, Shao Freya River that day. He orders more food, enough for both of them, and both of them, and Sato for drinking. He settles at an open table as the food is brought out, teetering on a bamboo stool at the end of at the end of his day, with rice beer warming his belly, J.D. can't help smiling at his dour subordinate. As is usual, even with, even with good food before, Kanya remains herself. Kun Biram, Biram Bakadi was complaining about, about Kun Birom Birom Bakad, Kun Birom Bakadi was complaining of, about you at headquarters. She says. He said he would go to General Praka, 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 if you have and have your smiling lips ripped off. Katie scoops chilies into his mouth. I'm not afraid. Of the anchor pads were supposed to be his territory, his protection racket, his bribe money. First you worry about trade, now you worry about Biron Bacati. That old man is afraid of his own shadow. He makes his wife taste every dish for him to make sure he won't get blisterized. He shakes his head. Stop being so sour. You should smile more. Laugh a little. Here, drink this. JD pours more sato for his lieutenant. We used to call our country the land of smiles. JD demonstrates. And there you sit, sad faced, as though you are eating limes all day. Perhaps we had more to smile about then. Well, 
That might be true. J.D. sets his Sato back on the splintered tabletop and stares at it thoughtfully. We must have done something terrible in our previous lives to earn these ones. It's the only thing I can think of that explains it all. Kanya sighs. I sometimes see my grand grandmother's spirit wandering around the shedi near my house. She told me one time she wouldn't reincarnate until we made a better place for her to arrive. Another of the contraction fee. How did she find you? Wasn't she Isan people too? She found me anyway, Kanya shrugs. She's very unhappy with me. Yes, well, I suppose we'll be unhappy too. JD has seen these ghosts as well, walking the boulevard sometimes, sitting in the trees. Fee are everywhere now, too many to count. He has seen them in the graveyards and leaning against the bones of riddled bow trees, all of them looking at him with some irritation. Mediums all speak of how crazy with frustration the fee are, how they cannot reincarnate and thus linger like a great mass of people at Guolamfong Station, hoping for a train ride down to the beaches, all of them waiting for a reincarnation that they cannot have because none of them deserve the suffering of this particular world. Monks, like Ajahn, like Ajahn Uthep, say it is, this is nonsense. He sells amulets to ward off these fee, and says that they are nothing but hungry ghosts, created by the unnatural death of eating, of eating from blister rust tainted vegetables. Anyone can go to his shrine and make a donation, or else go to the Arawan shrine and make an offering to Brahma. Perhaps have the temple dancers perform a little while, and by, and by a hope that the spirits may be put to rest to travel on to their next incarnation. It is impossible to hope for such things. Still, the ghosts are all around. Everyone agrees on that. The victims of Agrigen and Purical and all their ilk. JD says, I wouldn't take it personally about your grandma. On the full moon, I have seen the fee crowding the roads above the environment ministry, too. Many dozens of them. He smiles sadly. It's really impossible to fix, I think. When I think about it, Miwat and Surat growing up with this... He takes a breath, fighting back more emotion than he cares to show before Kanya. He takes another drink. Anyway, the fight is good. I just wish we could get a hold of some Agrigen or Purical executives and throttle them. Maybe give them a taste of this to us. AG134S. Then my life would be complete. I could die happy. You probably won't reincarnate either, Kanya observes. You are too good to end up in this hell again. If I am lucky, I'll be reborn in Des Moines and bomb their gene rip labs, if only. JD looks up at Kanya's tone. What's bothering you? Why so sad? We'll both be reborn somewhere beautiful, I'm sure, both of us. Think of all the merit we earned just that, just last night. I thought these customs he, uh, customs he, uh, are going to shit themselves when we burned the cargo. Kanya makes a bitter face. They probably never met a white shirt they couldn't bribe. And as quick as that, she kills his attempt at good humor. No wonder no one likes her at the ministry. No. No, that's true. Everyone takes bribes now. It's not like before. People don't remember the worst times. They are afraid. They are, they are afraid the way they were before. And now you drive down the, and now you, 
and now you die down the cobra's throat with the trade, Kanya says. After December 12th's coup, it seems as if General Praka and Minister Akara are always circling one another, looking for a new excuse to fight. They never finish their feud. And now you do something to further anger Akara. It makes things unstable. Well, I was always too gyron for my own good. Shia complains about it too. That's why I keep you around. I couldn't worry about Akarat, though. I, I wouldn't worry about Akarat, though. He'll spit for a while, then he'll calm down. He may not like it, but General Praka has too many allies in the army for another coup attempt. And Prime Minister Surawang dead, Akarat really has nothing left. He's isolated. Without megadons and tanks to back up his threats, Akarat may be rich, but he is a paper tiger. This is a good lesson for him. He's dangerous. KD looks at her seriously. So are Cobras. So are Megadons. So is Sibisosis. We are surrounded by dangers. Akarat, JD shrugs. Anyway, it's already done. There's nothing you can do to change it. Why worry now? Might been right. Never mind. Still, you should be careful. You're thinking of that man at the anchor pads. The one Somchai saw. Did he frighten you? Kanya shrugs. No. I'm surprised. He frightened me. JD watches Kanya, wondering how much he should say, how much he should reveal that he knows about the about the world around him. I have a very bad feeling about him. Really? Kanya looks distressed. You are frightened of one stupid man. JG shakes his head. Not afraid so that I will run and hide behind Shea's Fasim, but still, I've seen him before. You didn't tell me. I wasn't sure at first. Now I am. I think he is with trade. He pauses, testing. I think they are hunting me again. Maybe considering of another assassination. What do you think of that? They wouldn't dare touch you. Her ministry queen has spoken in your favor. JD touches his neck where the old spring gun scar still shows light on his dark skin. Not even after what I did to them at the anchor pads. Kanya bridles. I'll assign a bodyguard. Katie laughs at her fierceness and is warned and reassured by it. You're a good girl. But I'd be a fool to take a bodyguard. Then everyone would know that I can be frightened. That's not the way of a tiger. Here, eat this. He scoops more snake head claw into onto Kanya's plate. I'm full. Don't be so polite. Eat. You should have you should have a bodyguard, please. I'll trust you to guard my back. You should be more than enough. Kanya flinches. JD hides a smile at her discomfort. Ah, Kanya, he thinks. We all have choices we must face in life. I've made mine, but you have your own comma. He speaks gently. Go on and eat more. You look skinny. How will you find a special friend if you're only bones? Kanya pushes her plate away. I don't eat much these days, it seems. People are starving everywhere, and you can't eat. Kanya makes a face, scoops up a sliver of fish onto her spoon. JD sick, shakes his head. He sets down his own fork and spoon. What is it? You're even more blunt than usual. I feel like we've just put one of our brothers in a funeral or what's bothering you it's nothing really just not hungry speak up lieutenant i want straight talk from you it's an order you're a good officer i can't stand having your sad face 
don't like any of my people to be sad-faced, even the ones from me, son. Kanya grimaces. JD watches his lieutenant. Moles what she will say. He wonders if he was ever so tactful as this young woman. He doubts it. He has always been too brash, too easily angered. Not like Kanya, Dower Kanya. All Yai Jin, Jai Yin, eh, dyslexic. All Jai Yin, all the time. Not Sanuk at all, but certainly Jai Yin. He waits, thinking that at last he will hear her story, her full story in all its painful humanity. But when Kanya, Kanya finally summons the words, she surprises him. She speaks in a near whisper, almost too embarrassed to form the words at all. Some men complain that you don't take enough gifts of goodwill. What? Jaiti sits back, goggles at her. We won't participate in that sort of thing. We are different than the rest, and proud of it. Kanya nods readily. And the newspapers and whisper sheets love you for it. And the people love you for it. But her miserable look returns. But you don't get promoted anymore. And the men who are loyal to you get no help from your patronage. And they lose heart. Look what we accomplish. JD taps the taps the sack of money between his legs and that they confiscated off the clipper ship. They all know that if they have a need, they will be helped. We have more than enough for anyone in need. Kanya looks down at the at the table and mumbles. Some say you like to keep the money. What? JD stares at her dumbstruck. Do you think this? Kanya shrugs miserably. Of course not. JD shakes his head, apologizing. No, of course you want it. You've been a good girl. You've done great things here. He smiles at his lieutenant. Almost overwhelmed with compassion for the young woman who came to him, starving, idolizing him, and his years as, as a champion, wanting so much to emulate him. I do what I can to quash the rumor. I do what I can to quash the rumors, but Kanye shrugs again, miserable. Cadets say that under Captain JD is like starving of Aka worms. You work and you work and get skinnier and skinnier. These are good boys we have, They, but they can't help but feel ashamed when they have old uniforms and their comrades have new crisp ones. When they ride a bicycle two at a time, and their comrades ride kink spring scooters. JD sighs. I remember a time when white shirts were loved. Everyone needs to eat. Everyone needs to eat. JD sighs again. He puts the satchel out. He pulls the satchel out from between his legs and shoves it across to Kanya. Take the money. Divide it equally amongst them for their bravery and hard work yesterday. She looks at him, surprised. You are sure? JD shrugs and smiles, hiding his own disappointment, knowing that this is the best way, and yet saddened immeasurably by it. Why not? They're good boys, as you say. And it's not as though the Farang and the Ministry of Trade aren't feeling, aren't reeling at this moment. They did good work. Kanye Wise, deep respect ducking her head low and raising her pressed palms to her forehead. Oh, stop that nonsense. JD pours more sato into Kanya's glass, finishing the bottle. My pen dry. Never mind. These are small things. Tomorrow, we will have new battles to fight, and we'll need good loyal boys to follow us. How will we overcome the agrogens and pure cows of the world if we don't feed our friends? Chapter 7. Uh, let's see how long this one is. Can I get it done? In about 30 minutes. Yeah, chapters tend to have. Ooh, this is a long one.
might be able to do in half an hour. Well, no. I don't think I can finish in half an hour. I think this is a decent stopping point. Okay. Let's stop a little early then. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, we'll cut it short and then pick up next week. Uh, to how far through are you? About a third? About a third. About a third of the book through. Not bad. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. This has, of course, been Shay's Story Show reading um, Wind Up Girl by Paul Paolo Bacigalupi. Paolo Bacigalupi. If you all enjoyed it, be sure to give a like. Subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Share with your friends. Tell everybody about Shay's wonderful reading voice and give some kind words down in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching, Frost. Everybody else who was in the chat checking it out, we'll see you guys tomorrow.